The million dollar question, how do entrepreneurs transition from self-employed to owning a business that turns a profit? My name is Chris Waters, and this podcast has the million dollar answer. Welcome to CEO Secrets. Hey guys, welcome to CEO Secrets. Super excited to be joined today with Christopher Day, a marketing genius. He's got a, man, I was literally just on your website looking at this platform you created to help people write content. And I was like, dang, this is freaking gangbusters. I was like, man, I got it. I legit, I need to sign up for this because it's always a constant battle to figure out what to write about. But for you guys listening today, this guy has been ranked by Inc. 5000 as one of the fastest growing privately held companies in America. I think, was it last year you were in the top 100, Christopher? Uh, Top 200. Top 200. 200. Number one in Indiana. I mean, to be like, I think it said 212. Was that right? 212? Yeah. I mean, to be yep. 212 on the list is no joke. I mean, that's that's impressive growth. What was your percentage increase in growth uh, year over year? I think it was uh, 1,200 some percent. I can't remember. Holy exact shit. Number. Over 1,000 percent in one year. That's that's insane. Yeah, it's, so, it's super exciting. I, what we've discovered and, and what we've been rolling out over the last two years is absolutely amazing. We'll talk more about that as we go. But yeah, we're super excited. Man, for anybody that watches this show, I'm just so fascinated by marketing and the psychology component of it. So really excited to get into the the trenches with you and learn from you. So Chris, what's your what's your backstory before you started Demand Jump? Um, and that's demandjump.com. Before you started that uh, platform, what, what's your kind of background look like? What led you up to this point? Yep. So what led me to this point was having a series of businesses. I've been lucky enough to, to be part of the founding team of, I think, eight or nine different businesses over the last 30 years. And it was kind of the culmination of the experiences throughout all those businesses that marketing was always a black hole, right? Marketers are always largely left to guess, trying to figure out what they should do so that people see them, right? Get interested in their product or service and, and express a desire to buy, whether it's B2B or B2C. And I just, I thought, there has to be a better way. And those businesses include all different kinds of verticals. In college, I had 14 employees. It was a painting business. Then I started my first tech company. It was a broadband company. And we ended up selling that to Comcast, went on to get into automated meter reading. We did billing software for utilities. I was in investment banking, had a dot-com business in the bottled water industry. Uh, the list goes on. In every single one of those businesses, we would put a bunch of dollars into marketing, but really never know, is it working um, and be able to measure it coming out the other side. And the, the world has changed. It's fast forwarded decades and literally a matter of weeks with COVID. So yeah, that's kind of what, what has led me to, to this point and the desire to start Demand Jump. And I met my partner, Sean Schwegman, who was a CMO at Overstock from $3 million to $800 million. Uh, I met him and we started talking about Demand Jump probably two years before we actually started it. So your business partner, Demand Jump, is the previous guy that started Overstock.com? He was the CMO at Overstock. Okay, okay. So he, was, he was there from $3 million all the way through the IPO. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I bet almost everybody on here knows what Overstock is. What did he share with you or were some of the secrets for Overstock? going into what I believe is a pretty crowded space of selling furniture and other various items. What was his, you know, what was the secret sauce for him on the marketing side to drive the brand awareness around Overstock? Yep. It's the, it's the data that's outside your four walls that you can't see that you don't know, right? We, as, as business owners or as marketers, we don't know what our target market is actually thinking. And so if there's a way to tap into the data beyond our four walls, that data is exponentially more important than the data inside my four walls, than the actions I'm taking. And so he is a, uh, Sean's a data maniac and would would pull together as much data as they could get their hands on outside their four walls, process that data to understand where they had gaps and how to better serve or be present when, you know, with specific keywords or phrases that the target market was actually asking about that's what they focused on. And that's that's one of the big things that propelled their growth. So something that might precede buying furniture, for example, is somebody's searching for a home for sale. Yep. So would he, I guess, as an example, would he take, build a huge database of prospective home buyers and then market to them and push over stock.com? Yep. So what our technology does, I'll give you a real super simple example. I'm going to use lipstick. It's one of my favorites. Uh, so we entered in you know, all the large brands of lipstick. 
and we press a button and say, and you enter a topic called lipstick and you say, go. And the platform maps out the entire world in a matter of five minutes. And it, one of the things it tells you is the most powerful questions that people are asking ranked in order of their connectivity, their power within the network, right? The internet's a big network of networks, expanding, contracting, changing every single day. The most powerful question in the world for lipstick is what does lipstick stand for? None of the manufacturers, zero, were answering that question in their content. And so the search engines, social engines, et cetera, they're in charge of the matchmaking, right? Buyers and sellers are just two people who want to get match made, but they're not in charge of finding each other. Some third party is. And so those third parties, they want to give that end consumer the best experience possible. So when they ask a question or conduct a search, they serve the top 10 people that they believe are most closely aligned with answering that question. That is the secret. Hang on. And so people are it? literally, um, I'm a little uh, like what you just said is a little mind boggling. So you're saying people are searching. What does lipstick stand for? Stand for. Right. So historically going back decades and centuries, why do women wear red lipstick? Why do they wear matte lipstick? Why do they wear glossy lipstick? Why do they wear any color of lipstick for different occasions? What it means. Um, that's, that's what a lot of women, that's the number one most powerful question that women are asking when they're trying to make a decision about what lipstick they buy. Well, so if I make lipstick, I want to answer that question and then put in links or my products accordingly throughout that article. So they're more apt to buy from me because I built trust, right? I understand their desires, right? So, so should I go ask my wife, are you Googling what does lipstick mean? Absolutely. Oh my and God. I just learned something new today. I'm literally yes. going to go ask her this question as soon as we get done. Yeah. So, in, And in the case of ChristopherWaters.com, so I did some Googling right before this podcast. And so let, let's say I live in California or I live in New York or I live in any state and I'm thinking about moving, right? I'm, I'm, do I move to Denver? Do I move to Austin? Do I move to Atlanta? Do I move to Indianapolis? You know, I want to move for certain reasons. And so let's say, let's say I've now made the decision to actually move to Austin. Well, I need a broker to help me find my new home for my family or, or my condo for myself personally or whatever it may be. Well, that person's asking a lot of questions. And they might be, why is, I'm just making up something. I don't know. We haven't entered the, the data to know, but, but we would enter in our platform, you know, ChristopherWaters.com. And then we would enter in, you know, you pick three, four, five, you know, other websites that are, you know, either competitors directly or indirect competitors. And then we would just enter in brokers in Texas or Austin brokers. And it would tell us what are the questions that people are asking when they're thinking about Austin, Texas. Because they may not be asking about brokers at all. It might be, why is Austin a great city to live in? Or is Austin a safe city? And if you're answering those questions, you're going to show up. And now we've developed a, a virtual relationship already in my research and evaluation phase. And I'm more apt to call you to serve my, my home search needs. Yeah, it's, it's interesting you say that. So something I've kind of discovered is, you know, very few people are typing in, you know, when you look at all the analytics on Google, very few people are from a percentage perspective relative to the gross number of searches specific to real estate. Very few people are typing in, I need a realtor or I need a broker. They're typing in things like, what are the best schools for my kids? Yes. Um, exactly. What are the best, you know, uh, for people that are into boating, what are the best areas to, to enjoy boating activities? What are the, you know, culture related things? Where are the best shows, concerts, things like that? You know, a lot of the things related to what people like to do for fun helps drive, for example, where they decide to buy. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. And, and we would see that in five minutes in the platform of exactly the questions they're asking, but more importantly, ranked in order of which ones are the most connected or powerful questions. And then you click one more button, and in 30 seconds, it gives you the content brief. So, all the we like to say, we do all the science, and then you overlay the art. So we literally hand our customers a content brief that says, write your content for this number one most powerful thing, write it exactly with this structure, overlay your art or your domain expertise onto it, and then post it. So would you say you're more of like a product development guy or more of a marketing guy? Neither. Neither. I, you know, I've been asked that a lot. And a lot of people believe that I'm highly technical. They think I know how to code or that I'm a data scientist or, or something or other. I'm a listener. 
And, and every company that I've ever started was because I was listening to lots of relationships about many different pain points. And when I hear a pain point, I find interesting that I think, do I know people who are smarter than me that I could go find and hire and put the right butts in the right seats to go solve that pain in a unique, novel, elegant, new way? I think my strength is listening and having an open mind, not being closed-minded about how to solve any given problem in a new way and getting people who work collaboratively and, and, and work well together, right butts, right seats, and try to get them to think differently and try to solve a, a problem in a novel, unique, elegant, new way. Who are some of the people you look up to or mentors that are a source of inspiration and kind of a, you know, a, a knowledge center you go to learn more and continue to, to improve as a marketer, entrepreneur, all of those, you know, things related to ultimately helping you become one of the fastest growing companies in America? Yep. So, you know, honestly, almost everyone, I find value in the person that valets the cars in our office building. But if, if you know, some of these names people won't be familiar with in this podcast, but if I go back, you know, to early on, I had a coach and he just passed away recently. His name was Coach David Manier, who, you know, who believed in me as a child. There was a kind of a rough upbringing and, and he believed in me and, and said, hey, I'm going to let you succeed on your own merits, right? Not because, you know, people might not like your father or something, right? And then, you know, as I got my first job, there was a gentleman named Jim Cochran who built apartments, student housing at Purdue University. And Jim Cochran took me under his wing and exposed me to things that I had never seen before, right? About how the construction and development process works. You know, as I moved along, I got into college. There's a gentleman named Al Worcester who owns a construction company. And he was an alumni of the fraternity I was in. And we were building a new fraternity house when I was on campus at Purdue. And Al took me under his wing because I volunteered to be the gopher boy to check on things because they were all, you know, over an hour away. And then my first job out of school, there was a guy named Mike Stratton and a guy named Christopher Kreifels and a guy named Larry Beasley, who was the managing principal for the office I worked out of, a company called Bovis. And they taught me something that's always stuck with me, and that's managed by fact. And he said, if you manage by fact, you can never get in trouble. So that's something that, that always stuck with me. You know, as I entered, you know, then the kind of the tech world, um, I met a guy named Bill Godfrey, uh, who had a very successful company called a primo that's a marketing automation platform any um, sorry to interrupt you i'm, I'm kind of I'm, i have a feeling the audience is wondering this are, are there any like big name gurus like for example in the copy space kind of the godfather of direct response copy and i don't know if you call him the godfather but i don't know from from my age group i feel like he is uh dan kennedy Guys like him, uh, are yeah. there any like national figures that you look up yeah. to that people in the, that are listening to the show right now? Um, yeah. I, I would say of? from a business standpoint, I don't know him personally, but I've read, you know, Jack Welch's books and, mm -hmm. and I believe in a lot of his philosophy. It makes sense. It's like common sense things. Jack Welch, um, the former CEO of GE. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Um, there's a, a gentleman named uh, George Musi, who's big in marketing. He's up in New York. He's on the innovative cutting edge of, of things. We talk not, not often, but every once in a while, but it's, it, I, I just more crave, I crave data and that data comes from everywhere. Uh, there's a, there's a blog called open view there's, open view is a venture capital, a very well-known venture capital group out of Boston, uh, uh, out of Boston, Massachusetts. That's extremely successful. And they write incredible content in and around marketing, product-led growth, and absolute thought leaders. So I, I read their content a lot. Is Demand Chump, is, uh, is your company bootstrapped or is it uh, VC, PE funded? What's the yeah. you know, back end of the company look like? Yep, we're VC backed and we've raised about $15 million to date. Um, so we're VC backed and have... Folks like Bob Davoli, who's out of Boston, a very, very, I'd say a legendary venture capitalist. Um, he's also the managing member at Sigma Prime. But um, Bob Davoli is one of our major investors. Panoramic Ventures, formerly BIP Capital out of Atlanta, one of our major investors. Uh, Bill Godfrey, Hyde Park Venture Partners out of Chicago, uh, and some others are, are all venture capital backers. What's been your experience so far going down the VC route? Has it been 
you know, would you advise somebody listening to this show to, to look at VCs? Uh, I've, I've heard mixed reviews. Sometimes you hear uh, sayings like VCs eat their young. Um, what's, what's been your, what's been your experience thus far? So, um, you know, I think it really depends on the entrepreneur and what you're trying to tackle. So in, in our case with demand jump, you know, we're building a technology that is extremely complicated to figure out on the back end. a lot of R and D, a lot of engineering, a lot of data science. Right. And so you simply can't do that bootstrapped. You have to have the cash to be able to hire the talent to go, go and try and figure out these problems. And so it's just, uh, we have to be venture capital backed, right? How many years since you launched the product, like your MVP and, um, how many customers are you up to now? And what, what's the average ticket value per customer? Like what are they paying per month on a, I assume it's like a subscription basis. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we just launched what we're going to market now with, um, we just launched it middle of December last year. So that was five years of research and discovery, research and development, trying to figure this out. Wow. Holy cow. So. Yep. So we just we just launched it uh, middle of December last year. We have 150 customers. Um, average ticket size is thirty thousand dollars, and we have people paying us a hundred dollars a month all the way up to uh, seven hundred thousand dollars a year. Okay. Um, wow, that's a broad range. Yep. It's a real it broad would, range. And that's a I, yeah, I would, ass- I, would I would assume the guys spending seven hundred grand a year are you know helping provide content and ideas for a pretty large copywriting team. Yeah, these are Fortune, you know, those are Fortune 250 global companies. So, you know, we work with Fortune 250 Global, one of the biggest marketing clouds in the world, and all the way down to, you know, SMBs that you've never heard of. How did you get a Fortune 250 company when you're a essentially a startup? I mean, one of the biggest challenges for startups is, you know, big Fortune 250 companies like, well, what if this company goes bust? Right? There's a lot of potential threats for a large enterprise when working with a yeah. you know a startup. How'd you overcome yeah. that? So it comes down to the actual people that work inside those companies. So if you know those Fortune Fortune 250 companies, some of them have extremely uh well they're all they all have intelligent people, right? But they have to have people on their team that that think differently, that are innovative, that are risk takers, that have the authority to be a risk taker, right? And so they know they have to do something different. And they know they might have some hits and misses, but they know they can't do the whole traditional, you know, ways they used to execute marketing. They have to think differently. And so it really comes down to the individual person inside that company. You know, were they were they promoted or or put into a position to be a risk taker, to figure something out differently, to move the needle? Um, or are they just kind of in charge of the same old thing, you know, brand or whatever it may be? That's what it really comes down to the individual person. We, we find that a lot of these large Fortune 500 companies that talk about digital transformation, they talk about it, but they're really not doing it. Mm-hmm. But some of them are. There's two questions coming to mind. I don't want to forget either one of them. One is a lot of you know, well-funded large enterprises are like, well, we'll just buy you and bring you in-house. Or we'll just recreate what you've created because we have enough money to recreate it. How do you overcome that? That's one thing on my mind. And then, you know, and I'm sorry, I'm throwing both these, these at, at you at the same time, but I just, I don't want to forget. Uh, so that's question one. And question two is, I want to give you an ex- extreme scenario where let's say you guys have a potential customer and um, they're in a hyper competitive field and, you know, it's, it's um your customer is somebody that's doing great in their local respective market, but they're competing with a national juggernaut. And let's say, for example, for SEO purposes, this national juggernaut has 300 million backlinks directed to their site. And this local company has got like 5,000. How the hell do you compete and grow and catch up to that national company? So those are my two questions and I'm sorry, I'm throwing them both at you at once. I just, they're going through my head and I do, I was like, I got this guy's attention. I can't forget to ask these questions. Yeah, absolutely. So both great questions. So um, the first question, you know, people throw across innuendos acquisition, or, you know, is it a bona fide, you know, offer, right? I mean, if somebody's really serious, they'll put an LOI on the table to get the conversation started. Um, what we're onto is a multi, multi-billion dollar 
opportunity. It, it's massive. It, it changes how er, everything that anybody ever thought about SEO or content or content strategy, content creation, execution, backlinks, we'll get to that in a minute. It flips everything on its head. And so could someone just say, hey, I've got a lot of money and I'm going to go just recreate what you did? Uh, in theory, I mean, could they try to do that? Absolutely. Right. Um, a lot of ego-driven CEOs might think that. Absolutely. And, and a lot of them go out and build things. A lot of them home build CRMs and they go home build all kinds of things. And those products usually end up in absolute failure in three to five years after spending 10, 15, 20 million dollars. What's what uh, sucks though is if you're demand jump and you got some ego driven CEO that thinks he can do it, right? You just missed out on the sale. That's okay. I'll so go do, do you, I'll go I'll go hit all those five competitors. Yeah. Right? That's okay. I People can be arrogant and egocentric and that's fine. And those people typically don't stay on the fortune 500 list either. Is there any way right? to, is there any way to turn that ego driven CEO around that thinks they can go recreate what you created? So, you know, we haven't run across that yet. That, that's not, somebody's not said, we're just going to go recreate this. Um, I did have a chief scientist at a major company say. Um, You're too new. That's to, the only reason it hasn't happened to you yeah. yet. It's going to. Yeah. Well, I get, and maybe it has happened once as I think about it. We, we did have a chief scientist say, hey, if you show me exactly how you're doing this, then we'll buy. But I want to trust how you're actually doing this. And I, of course, said, no. I mean, you can know that, but then you'd have to acquire us, right? I'm not going to tell you how we do it. Does Google tell you how their algorithms work? No. Does Bing? Does Facebook? Does Amazon? No. None of those, none of those platforms tell you exactly how they do things. And so, and nor would, if you ask them, what would they tell you? So, but I did have a chief scientist at a major global brand. Um, and we showed them exactly why there are certain brands are getting crushed and why some of their brands are number two or five or 10 or whatever, and, and not all number ones. And we ended up not doing business. But so I guess that did happen in one situation. I don't yeah. think they're trying to build it, but, but he wanted to, us to, to hand over our IP and we're just yeah. not going to do that. To your second question, you know, how does a small local company um, you know, compete with, you know, the 800 pound juggernauts. So please don't easily. say long tailed keywords. No, um, very easily. When you understand the structure of any given topic. So a topic can be coffee cup, Ferrari calculator, customer success software. It can be chair, couch. It can be anything in the world, any topic, any product or service that you sell, that's a topic. And there's a concept of pillar topics and then, and then support pillars and then blogs. But if you understand the connectivity of the network around any given topic, it is all about how words are structured and writing content that is aligned to the most powerful words that are connected in that network. Backlinks, are they still important? Okay, yeah, maybe at some level. Well, I mean, it's but, all about published content getting redirected to you, so. Right. Yeah. So Number of backlinks you, may not be as important as it used to be, but content obviously is, yeah. But content is 100x more important than it used to be. <laughs> and so, because everything is organic today. So, if you structure your content that is better aligned and more relevant to the actual most powerful questions and searches being conducted, you will win every time. And we've got many, many use cases or case studies to prove that this is true. Like clients that are able to outrank the big national juggernaut in the uh, search engine results? Yeah, Demand Jump does today. For marketing attribution, we outrank all of the juggernauts, all of them. What, what's, a, um, what's a hyper competitive keyword you guys rank for uh, that you know, you've got some 800 pound gorillas? Marketing attribution. Marketing. So Google marketing attribution, you guys will rank higher. And we're on the first page. And then, but if you look at it, so, so content creation or marketing attribution are two that we're really big on. And so, but what's important is not just the words marketing attribution. It's all of the questions that people are asking. So if you think about you and I, our personal behavior, we, we work with smart devices today, right? We talk to our phone. We ask, we do searches in the form of questions. And whoever answers those questions more uh, cohesively than the next person will win because the search engines believe that you are more relevant to that target audience. 
Ooh, you man. I just Googled marketing attribution and you're ranking higher than HubSpot. Holy shit. See, that's what I'm saying, right? That's so impressive. It, you're right below salesforce.com. Oh, man. Yep. That's pretty good. Nice. Proof is in the pudding, right? Yeah, that's impressive, man. What was the other keyword? Marketing attribution and what What else? Content creation. Content creation. Oh, well, that's, a, that's, a, that's a real competitive one. Yep. I'm doing this on the fly right now as you do it. You know, sometimes uh-huh. you got to call people out on their bullshit. <laughs> right now, you're not bullshitting. That's right. Uh, content creation. Let's see. Oh, there you are again. Holy cow. That's impressive. So the, the ecosystems around those, those two, those are, those are what we call pillar topics, right? And so under that pillar topic for each one of those, there's about five or six or seven support pillars and then a bunch of blogs. And it's that whole structure that's cohesively connected together that matches the network to the population asking questions. That is why we rank so well. And so our traffic, our inbound traffic has gone from 3,000 to over 70,000 a month year over year. Our sales leads have increased 6x. Customers are skyrocketing out the roof. Our free trials have gone from basically, you know, a couple to I think we're pushing 300 a month now. It's insane. Wow. That's awesome, man. That's super exciting. That's really cool. Huh. I mean, I'm kind of sold on you. I need to go get my go get my trial set up right now. Yeah, we would. I'll, we'll give you the white glove. We'll give you the white glove treatment. I'll let the team know if you want to come through and check it out. And we would we would um, we would probably be doing a, a quick analysis, entering like you know ten or twenty different potential pillar topics, kind of see what the lay of the land looks like, and then working with your team would say, okay, well, let's start on this one. You know, would pick one and go with it. Good question. A trend perspective. Do you see outside of uh, Google, do you see any uh, platforms that will grow and uh, supersede Google? And maybe a, maybe a caveat I'll add to that is, you know, something I, I'll just share with you something I've kind of discovered in my industry is consumer intent is much stronger on Google than it is Facebook. And so lead quality obviously is is much better in Google. Um, do you see a do you see anybody that's that in the in the near future could compete with Google in terms of driving really high quality uh, leads to businesses? Any, uh, well, we any trending consider, platform? Yeah, we don't consider ourselves a competitor to Google, but I, I do believe that Demand Jump is the number one company in the world that will drive anybody more leads than anybody else. I think that's Demand Jump. I, we're not a competitor to Google, right? We're friends with Google. We we leverage their platform for certain things. But when it comes to on-page SEO, first page rankings, I don't think there's, I, I don't, I'm not saying this in an arrogant way at all. And it took me 24 months to be confident to actually say this, but I now believe that Demand Jump is the most powerful platform in the world that will drive you more first page rankings, traffic, leads, which gets you close one customers and revenue and increased valuation of your business multiple than anybody else. What do you, so for anybody listening to this, they're like totally sold on demand jump. Like right now I'm, li- I'm literally ready to go <laughs> turn, hang up and go get this going. What should their marketing department look like from a roles, you know, from a roles perspective, you know, there's a lot of people in the SMB space or, you know, small, medium businesses listening to our show right now. And, you know, they're wearing a lot of different hats. What do you think they're, you know, who do you think they need to hire? What does their marketing team need to look like? Marketing department need to look like to fully take advantage of demand jump? So, um, well, so I thought you were going to say that in general. So I want to answer that in general first. In, in general, if I was trying to bring on a marketing department or looking at the existing marketing department and, and trying to figure out how we you know, move people around to be more successful... I would think of the skill set first. And the skill set is someone who is curious and has some level of analytical skills. So like a lot of our customer success team at Demand Jump, they weren't marketers when we brought them in, but they were very hungry, very curious, and very analytical. Let's let's like from an org structure perspective, let's break this down for the audience. So what's the job title of the person at the top of your market? Like again, let's say the assumption is somebody's listening to this. 
they are the marketer in chief, but they're also the sales in chief. They're the salesperson in chief. And, um, they're, you know, they, they have the revenue, they have the resources and revenue, and they want to go build out a legitimate marketing department. Who are those players from a job title perspective, starting from top down? Okay. So depending on how big the company is, it'd be a marketing manager, a director of marketing or a VP of marketing, right? So that's the, that's more at the top. Up, so that's right? the first person you'd hire. Yep. Okay. That's, that's the first person. And that yep. person has to be curious and analytical, right? It's more important than brand today. We can get to brand in a minute. That's number one. Number two is someone who focuses on organic. Let me, in, let me interrupt you real quick, specific to this kind of marketing head person. So you said somebody intellectually curious and analytical. How important is it to find somebody that has the experience from doing a lot of various split testing in your specific industry? How important is that? Because, you know, if you hire, if like, let's say real estate, for example, if I went and hired somebody that was the former CMO of realtor.com or Zillow, and they're spending over a hundred million dollars a year in advertising, their knowledge base from split testing all these various marketing mediums is for someone that's in the SMB space, unquantifiable, right? Like the, that knowledge is like, you would think is unquantifiable. Do you agree with that or do you disagree? I disagree. And this is why sometimes, and I'm not, I'm not, by the way, if a CMO of any of those companies is listening, I, I'm not talking about any of those individuals. I'm just saying in, in general, if we, if we, if we think about the real world, that's not necessarily true because of a couple of things. Number one, sometimes people are successful in, despite their skill set. And so sometimes timing and what a company offers or whatever, and it just skyrockets, right? And it's not necessarily because of one individual person. So sometimes people get lucky on a rocket ship. That happens. But most like CEO advisors, coaches, consultants, whatever, would advise you to hire somebody that's got relevant industry experience and shown upward trajectory to increase your probability of finding somebody that can go unblindfolded blindfolded and execute and grow. And you're saying that's not, not necessarily the case and that you may not have to find that person. That's not necessarily the case, right? Like a, a smaller company hiring somebody at that level in a smaller company, they might totally fail because they're not used to also being responsible for cleaning the toilets. Yeah. Right. And that's the kind of the old adage, right? Like you got to get it, someone that's okay being in the trenches. Yeah, wearing a lot of hats. Attention. They're willing to get their hands dirty. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and they're not used to having an assistant to go get their coffee. Right. So back, so back to org structure, you got the head of marketing at the top. Um, yep. And then talk, then talk about the people below. Then you need an SEO person, someone responsible for SEO. So it'd be SEO manager or director of SEO, whatever you want to call the title, but somebody what, who owns. And SEO. what, what's that person doing? So that person is trying to figure out what content to write that aligns and is most relevant to your target market. So is that person like working on the demand jump platform and then hiring copywriters to write the copy specific to what demand jumps recommending? Correct. Okay. Got it. Okay. You, then you have let a me, paid. Oh, let me throw one more thing okay. at you. So on the copywriting front, where do you find the best copywriters? So we have a few agencies that we work with that use our platform exclusively that have, that are content creation agencies. Okay. And all they do is sit there and create content all day long. What do so, they charge per article they write? Uh, it depends on uh, if it's a, if it's a blog, let's say it's a 500 to a thousand word blog. It'll run maybe as low as 350 and as high as like 550 wow, per blog. That's a lot. That's a lot. No, it's cheap. It's cheap. So like these platforms like up, upwork.com yeah. where you can go and hire, you know, copywriters and yeah. pay 25 to $50 an hour, right? Yeah. Are those garbage compared to these guys that you're paying 350 to 500 for? Exactly. How many of those get seen? How many of those actually rank on the first page? Let me tell you the number. 10%. Okay. 90% of all of the contents. So you get what you pay for. Web pages, that's right. You get what you pay for. 90% of all web pages and blogs never get seen. I saw right that now, on your LinkedIn we're... profile. Yeah, I should. I need yeah. to put that on there. Yeah. Uh, or is it on there? It's on there. Yeah. Okay. It's so, a very, uh, it's a very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's very uh, disheartening. It's very uh, frustrating. It's uh, demoralizing. <laughs> it's pretty, demoralizing. Yeah, I mean, Christopher, pretty, think about it. If we went to bed tonight and knew that tomorrow morning, I'm going to wake up 
And out of an eight hour workday, which you and I don't work eight hours, we probably more work like, you know, 16 hours. 90% of my time, I'm going to, I'm going to waste 90% of my time tomorrow. It's going to be totally unproductive. Yeah. So, you, know how many, so you, know, you know how many blogs are being written right now as you and I speak today? Right now, today, you and I, as we speak, 4.5 million blogs are being written right now. Wow. Per day. Per day. Holy moly. It is insane. How do you cut through the noise? How do you cut through the noise? And, and I'm not saying anything bad about these, these, net, these platforms that have these, you know, these writers all over the place. But those writers are writing from a position of, here's the big difference. Marketers, I, I think marketing is the hardest job in the C-suite or the hardest department. And, and the CMO has got the hardest job in the C-suite. The deck is stacked against them. Every other department has a, a platform or a tool that they can put data into, apply some BI and make better decisions. Every single one. Warehousing, operations, finance, sales, you name it. There's finite data gets put into this thing and you massage that data and get a and, and get some efficiency out of it. In marketing, you ha- you can't touch and see and feel the internet. You can't touch and see and feel or know what you're thinking when you're thinking about buying a golf club or a piece of software or whatever you're doing, right? For your business. I have no idea what you're actually thinking. And so what have marketers done over the years, over the decades and centuries? They market from a position of domain expertise. I make this widget. I make. I have this service. And by golly, I'm the best at it. And this is why you should buy my shit, right? Well, back to lipstick. Women don't care about your lipstick. What they care is, what does it stand for? Is it safe? Uh, matte versus gloss. What are the ingredients? What are the unsafe ingredients? These are all questions that they're asking that leads them to a decision of what to buy. And so marketing must lead with what the target market is actually asking, thinking, and doing. How much does somebody need to allocate to content creation, assuming it's 350 to 550 an article to go compete with that 800 pound juggernaut? Like what's a healthy budget to allocate to content creation, not including what you got to pay demand jump? Yep. So, um, so we, I'll just give you some real life examples of customers we have. So again, you asked a really great question on how competitive are these topics, right? Which, which means difficulty in increasing your rankings. So marketing attribution and content creation. Um, we went out and spent about $60,000 a piece to really go hard at both of those pillars and produced, and I may be a little high on my 60,000, it might've been 50,000, but that's a rough number. Let's call it $50,000 plus or minus to stand up that pillar. And that's about 90 pieces roughly. And that includes a pillar topic about four or five support pillar topics, and then a bunch of blogs under each support pillar topic that feeds up to the pillar, right? So it's like, think of it as a a tree, right? Mm -hmm. So we spent about that much on each of those, about 90 pieces um, total between the two. Now we maintain them. And so we'll write two to four blogs per week to maintain those pillars. We have customers today that literally on their first blog rank for some really important keyword to their business. Literally on one blog, 500 bucks, one blog, bam, first page or number one ranking. We have it. It's not abnormal. It happens all the time. We have other customers that started off with one or two blogs. They're spending 500, 1,000 bucks, a couple thousand bucks a month, kind of getting their feet wet. They see the success. And we have one right now that's accelerating from 2000 to $400,000 because they want to hit six pillars. Mm-hmm. So... It, it's all over the board, but I mean, those are those are real numbers, right? To give you an idea of, you can yeah. have success by just starting off with a, with a consistent, methodical. You know, you could start with one blog a week. You can spend five hundred bucks a week if you want to. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Let's go back to the org structure. So you've got your head of marketing, which could be a CMO, director of marketing, VP of marketing. And below that, you've got your search engine marketing manager. Who's overseeing the copywriters working with that copywriting ad agency, content agency, and demand jump? And then who's yep. your next? Who's who are your other uh, folks? The next, one, the next one would be paid. Then so mm-hmm. organic, organic. The reason I say organic first, SEO organic first, that impacts everything downstream. So the next thing I would do is paid, and I would start off. That person would be over like paid search, for example. Okay. Um, and so that paid search is going to follow suit on the organic strategy. So all of the keywords, the long tail keywords, et cetera, and how they execute against paid search follows that same strategy. And I I would do that second because 
our cost per lead has decreased from $400 to less than $100 because it's much more efficient, right? So now you're going to spend much less on your paid efforts and that cost per lead is going to go drastically down. So that's why I say paid search second. Okay. So you got a person overseeing paid search, which could be overseeing Facebook, Google, YouTube, by on and on and on. Yep. Okay. And then I might, depending on that person's skill set, I might have a separate person for social. Let me ask you a quick question. That person, are they the one actually going in and building out the campaigns in Google and all these different platforms? Like they're literally setting them all up? Yes. Okay. Got it. And do you think you should bring, at what point do you bring that person in-house versus outsourcing it? Is it a function of how much you spend? I think it's a function of your strategy, right? If you're going to outsource it, you know, not all paid search folks are created equal, right? There's paid search agencies that do a great job. And there's paid search agencies that, that do an awful job. And they don't touch your account for months on end. And the and the company doesn't even know it because they don't know how to go into Google ads and look at it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think it depends on your growth strategy. I think it depends on a lot of things. I got to get a pen and paper because I'm learning so much from you. No joke. This is this is freaking gold. I'm going to highlight this episode and tell every single person they got to tune in and watch this shit like two to three times. Hey, I interviewed last week the guy that ranked number 16 on the Inc. 5000 list, backed by J-Lo and a- A-Rod. And uh, uh, the guy is amazing, amazing, amazing dude. Great episode, by the way. People tune in and watch that. But man, this has been one of the coolest ones I've done. So anyways, carry on. So we got... Uh, VP of marketing at the top. We got the organic guy who's working with uh, content creators yep. and demand jump. And then we got the paid guy who is either in-house or out being outsourced. And what were you saying in terms of how do you make the decision if they're in-house or outsourced? You said strategy-based. Tell me more. Yeah. So I, I just think it, it depends on you know how much budget you have. So now you're starting to talk about if you're going to be a bootstrap business, you're going to have to outsource that, right? If you're going to go the venture capital route and you've got the cash to sustain right all that front end work and 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 to have a person full time, well, then you you probably would want to have a, a person full time. Yeah. If you can afford it, you, you bring it in house. Uh, would you recommend hiring somebody that is industry specific or could it be industry agnostic? Yeah, I think it's industry agnostic. Again, it's back to, so let's just take Google ads as an example. Google ads is, is a complex machine. There's all kinds of knobs and bells and whistles and buttons and levers and whatever that you should push and pull and, and turn on, turn off, you know, broad match and whatever, all these different things. And that person has to be an analytical minded person, has to be, because they're not afraid to get in there and move those knobs and whistles and push and pull levers, et cetera. You don't just go into Google ads and like, say, I'm going to bid on this keyword and call it a day and see, I want to spend $1,000 a month or $100 a month or $10 a day, whatever the number is, and walk away. It's dynamic. Okay. There's one, what is it? One or 2 trillion searches, 2 trillion searches that happen every single year. You ready for the next stat? 22% of them are unique, net, new, never searched before. That is astounding. This is exponential complexity. That's how fast this stuff is changing. Woo, so, that makes the life of a marketer hard. I, I can almost the marketer today. I mean, you still have to have your, it's like you're either creative or you're analytical. And if you're not sure which one, you're dead. And, and so like the analytical side, it, it's almost like Wall Street grade analyst type people that should be involved in marketing. And those people paired with your creative people. And that's the recipe for magic. Okay. So we got someone leading organic. We got somebody leading paid search. You mentioned somebody leading social. I'm assuming somebody leading mass media. Yep. So um, you're, now your, your paid person could all, might have the skill set to handle paid and social. Okay. Those, could be, those could be grouped together. Then you probably are going to want to have a creative person. So there's a lot, and, or you could outsource it, right, to an agency. But you have just all kinds of, uh, you know, Add, add copy. Like, so like, you know, what's the, what's the visual, right? What's the visual in your ads or what's the, what's the visual in your collateral or what's the visual on your homepage, your website. And by the way, we want to make a bunch of upgrades to our website. We, we think it needs massive advancement. Like we've been so busy on product. We haven't paid attention to our website, but having that creative person on the team 
there, there's just never a shortage of the look and feel or images. What's um, an example of what the creative person does for people listening to this that don't understand what a creative person could do for them? So let's say uh, you know you're searching for something and you see an ad, so something that captures your attention, right? So instead of just the, I'm just being really generic. Instead of just a little company logo, you know, it's a bar chart that lights up and fires up and goes up and to the right with a little rocket ship. So it catches your attention and you kind of read what this ad's about, right? Or it could be the collateral that you, you send out a one pager to a prospect. They say, hey, can you send me a one pager on, you know, on what you do? Or can you send me a use case, right? So they're, they're literally looking at the stylization of what that one pager or what that ad copy actually looks like, mm -hmm. the colors that you use. Right, the image, the imagery you use, uh, that kind of stuff. Got it. Um, what are we missing? We said creative, social, paid, organic, mass media. What are we missing? So you know, we didn't talk about programmatic, which is display. A lot of companies spend a lot of money on on display, um, and it's back to the same concept. The way everybody's been taught how to run display, they've been taught that that is a impression game. Like the more, if we can drive you sixty billion impressions, then we've been successful. And we say that's all garbage. And it's all built on audience data. So like you could go to Blue Kai, for example, right now, and look at your own personal audience data, and it would be maybe 50% correct. Um, so, we, so if you just think about your own experience on the internet, when you're in business mode and, um, and somebody's serving you ads for you know, golf knickers, you know, because you're going to go on a fun golf trip and you want to have golf knickers or whatever, I'm just making something up, right? Well, you're not paying attention to that because you're in business mode and you're like, I've got to close 500 homes this month or, or whatever, right? There's, there's other things that are pressing on your mind. And so serving you an ad for golf knickers because you searched that at midnight last night while you're laying in bed, it does no good. But that's what everybody does. The better way to do it might be when you're back in that fun mode, in that personal mode, and you're looking for golf knickers again, for me to be relevant and bam, serve you an ad right then and there. When you're when when the search engine serves up the sites for golf knickers, then I should be I should be posting my ad at that very moment, right? And and so our platform informs that as well. What websites for any given product or service should you run your programmatic on? Um, and when people know those websites to do that on, their their results double and even more than quadruple. The so programmatic person, display person, if you want to do that. That could also be, depending on the skill set, it could also be part of your paid person's job description. Do you have any uh, thoughts or opinion on having somebody run a, a team of influencers? Almost like a customer advisory board? Um, you know, just like a head of brand ambassadors. Somebody that's out there like signing yeah. up and building an army of influencers that are pushing your product or service. Yeah. No, I think that that's a. I think that's kind of one of the next things that um, has definitely become more popular and successful in recent years. Um, I just think that, like for me, I'd be a brand ambassador for you in the real estate sector. I love that. Um, I mean, just as an example, right? Yeah, right. I think it's definitely something that somebody would have to focus on full time. The caution would be when people go out and uh, I'll just give you a real example. This goes back to years ago. I think Paris Hilton had like 2 million followers or something. This is a long time ago. And people thought they'd be a great ambassador, brand ambassador. But what was discovered in the data was a lot of people follow Paris Hilton, but they don't buy as a result of her recommendations. You know what's so fascinating about what you just said? So I, I mentioned a moment ago, we, um, we had a, a guest on last week. Uh, him and his two brothers started a company called Super Coffee, and they were ranked number 16 on Inc. 5000. And they were backed by Jennifer, they, one of their, you know, they have multiple people funding them, but um, uh, they had Jennifer Lopez uh, do an Instagram post that would normally cost half a million dollars to push their product. And they said they got uh, very, very few sales of their product from Jennifer Lopez's post. And I was like, my mind was just blown. I was like, are you kidding me? Um, however, he did tell me that um, uh, A-Rod has made their product part of his lifestyle. He consistently uh, talks about it. And um, their coffee has, it's called super coffee because it's got obviously you know a lot of caffeine, but also protein in it. 
And so he's, you know, that's had a bigger impact, but, um, back to what you were saying, ha- having a major influence or push, you may not necessarily drive results. That's bottom line. Yeah, that's exactly right. That totally makes sense to me. Right. Cause JLo, like if, if they made lipstick or rouge or some mask or something, you know, she, when I think of JLo, like I think of, I think of um, lifestyle, you know, lifestyle, dancing, singing artist, right? Like I'll, I think of a whole nother list of products, not coffee. And if it's performance coffee or, or, or caffeinated and it better tasting, works better, better for you or whatever, well, A-Rod is an athlete and performance. And I, I mean, so if, if you step back sometimes and just think about stuff with like logic, that feeds directly into that, that story. That totally makes sense. Cool. I can't even believe we've been at almost an hour now. <laughs> um, I haven't even gotten all my oh, questions yeah. here. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have one last question for you. Obviously, you provide a you know a technology product for marketers. What would you say uh, are you know if let's say you were the CMO of another company and maybe a completely unrelated space? What would you say are the top tools that should be in a you know a marketing leader's belt? What tools should be in their belt? Um, what are the top tools from a technology perspective? that um, they should be using. Um, obviously yeah. demand jump sounds like that obviously should be one of them, but what, what else in other categories would you say are the top ones? Yep. So I would say, um, so we think now of marketing and sales is tied together. So I, I, I have to kind of lump sales and marketing. They have to work in concert. So mm-hmm. I would say you, you have to have a, a CRM and a marketing automation tool first and foremost. And so, uh, you know, CRMs would be people like Salesforce, HubSpot, um, active campaign, Sharp Spring, great one. So those would be examples of of CRM and so marketing very, automation. Yeah. So those are your foundational pieces. Foundational sure. pieces. It's like your hammer in your tool belt. What else? Yeah. Yep. That's right. And then um, then you're going to depend on what business you're in. You're you're going to have to have a a, a platform to process payments. And so you know in the B two B world. And not that they don't do both, but you'd have someone like a charge beat, right? You have to have some way. Stripe, to you something like that. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. One of those guys. Um, okay. If you're an e-com company, you're going to use a Shopify or a big commerce or um, yeah, those, those, that group of people. I'm going to be selfish here. What are the top tools for a service based business? So for a service based business, depending on how big B2C. it is, I would go with. Mm-hmm. B, a B2C? B2C business? service business. What are your top tech tools? Yeah, I, I would go with a, a simplified, elegant um, CRM slash marketing automation platform. It also does email when I see market automation. So I'm going to say that's somebody like a, a SharpSpring or an active campaign or maybe a um, like a HubSpot. Just like start- get Salesforce and HubSpot and integrate them. Yeah. 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 And, and in the, integrating Salesforce and HubSpot alone um, is not as simple as it sounds. Yeah. It's a, lot so of work. It, it's a lot of work. So if you can find one that has a CRM, which they do, right? So SharpSpring, HubSpot, Active Campaign. If you can find one that already has a CRM and, and marketing automation on one platform, I would start with that. And, and, and that's a SharpSpring or an Active Campaign or a HubSpot. Mm-hmm. Um, then after that, you're going to go to Google Ads. You're going to fire up Google Ads. Um, you may or may not do LinkedIn and Facebook. Just my overall arching thing is social doesn't work for every business. So we, we all hear chatter about social, but it's not necessarily the most important thing. Would Sometimes you it, would you agree that like, I guess my perspective on social is it's really effective for people that have a really big addressable market. But if you have a small addressable market with like geographic restrictions, it's going to limit its effectiveness. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think it's right. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Cool. Um, what else? I mean, that's- CRM, marketing automation, the basic marketing mediums like you know Google AdWords, social media backend, ad management platforms. Yep. What about like some of these tech tools you use for your website? Like, um, I think there's one called Hotjar to track like what people are doing on your website, what they're looking at. Uh, what are some, any other examples of stuff like that? So yeah, there's a lot of free tools out there like that, right? It's like Hotjar is great. But like, I, I, I'm not trying to be self-serving, but the, the most important thing is figuring out content, what, you, what your content, what you should yeah. do. What's the first action I should take, mm-hmm. right? If, I, if I'm trying to capture people that want to buy a home, 
or sell their home, well, then that's where I would focus first on, okay, well, how am I going to align and be relevant to that target market? That's the first thing I got to figure out. Cool. Because I caught jars for seeing what people are doing on your website, right? Mm -hmm. Well, if I have a hundred people, it's not very important yet. Mm -hmm. Well, man, I've got a, look at this. I don't know if people can see my screen. I've got a page of notes here. Um, this has been great. Uh, Christopher, thanks so much for being on the show today. Uh, we're running at the one hour mark. Um, for people that want to learn more, I assume they're going to go check out demandjump.com. Is that the best place for them to go? Yeah, or, or if, or if they want to reach out to you personally, what's the best way for them to reach out to you personally? Um, on LinkedIn, um, it's Christopher Day 25, I think. Christopher Day, so search Christopher Day Demand Jump and you can find me through LinkedIn and shoot me a note or um, my, uh, let's just keep it to LinkedIn instead of email. Okay. okay, great. So for you guys listening to the show, reach out to Christopher Day, that's D-A-Y on uh, LinkedIn and check out his uh, platform demand jump. Um, it's, it's super impressive. I'm, I'm really excited to check this out. I, I, it seems like this is something that could give, uh, startups, bootstrapped companies, you know, newer companies, a, uh, fighting chance against the 800 pound juggernaut. So, um, this has been an incredible episode. I'm, I'm going to actually go through and listen to this a second time, Chris, but, um, for you guys tuning in to CEO secrets, be sure to hit that subscribe button. Uh, check out Demand Jump. I, I checked it out before uh, we did this podcast today, and was and it's it's quite impressive to say the least. And uh, tune into the next episode. All right, everybody, we'll see you next time. Bye, guys.